everybody. Welcome to episode 125 of the Rush Roundtable. Today we're talking about The Enemy Within from Grace Under Pressure. So to start things off, I just want to welcome, we have a new member here tonight, Michael. Feel free to say hello, Michael. We welcome you hello, here. Hello, everybody. It's always good to have new people. If you Thanks. Want, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. If you guys want to get involved with the Rush Roundtable, um, feel free to like and subscribe, and you can contact us through the contact info in the description. So we will start today with a reading from Song by Song by Rush. Actually, Alex Body's book, Song by Song. So, uh, Ralph, would you like to take uh, the lead on this? The Scott and reggae stylings that were touched on occasionally on Signals are fully realized in this song, part one of the Fear series. Whereas part two and three had dealt with fear caused by external threats, this song describes the unhelpful nature of self-induced fear, hypervigilance, and paranoia. A frantic bass line punctuated by jagged chorus laden guitar chords soon gives way to a dreamy electronic post chorus section. The frantic and ambitious nature of the music suits the lyrics, which arguably provides the first glimmer of optimism on the album. The fe fearful verses give way to a defined chorus. I'm not giving in to security under pressure. I'm not missing out on the promise of adventure. I'm not giving up on implausible dreams. A motivation to defeat the enemy within. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. You know, it's funny. There was a misheard lyrics episode here, and I always thought that this part of the tune, uh, not giving up on implausible dreams, I always thought it, it said impossible dreams. I don't know why, but I figured I'd just throw that in there. Um, so, I figured we'd focus on the, the lyrical content first, and maybe if uh, Alex, would you like to lead off on the first section of the tune, lyrically? Well, as, as was stated in the... Um intro in the song by song uh, our, our intro uh, for the song by song book that uh, Neil brought this uh, this inward enemy within so the first the first stanza the first verse uh, with the things crawling the darkness of the imagination spins I mean that's taking us back to childhood that's that's uh, someone lying in a crib lying in a bed as a, as a young child in the dark envisioning you know how many people want I'm not being afraid of the dark in so many shape or form at the point of the child. So he kind of begins at the beginning in some respects with the idea of the inward fear and the, our perceptions. Um, moving into the second section as far as the pounding in your, in your temples, surge of adrenaline, I mean it's certainly the physical manifestation. That's our inward fear moving, staying within us, remaining within us, but sort of beginning to affect our outward responses, reactions, etc. Yeah, and this kind of concludes the um, the trilogy where in part three, Witch Hunt was like the external, you know, part two, the weapon was kind of using the externals against you. That's something that was brought up in the uh, discussion before we started tonight. And then of course now we had this sort of concentric circle where now it's like um, with Neil approaching this particular trilogy he wanted to kind of save this part for last because he wanted to write about it in a way where it's it was actually harder to write about it as an internal thing he wanted to sort of make it a universal type of structure to the lyrics so being that you mentioned like it's now we're back at the beginning we're at the the birth of the, the fear thing as a child and now the circle is complete and it makes sense there's that concentric theme that i never knew was part of this trilogy till much later so but it's a, it's a really good point where now we're back at the beginning and it took to, to this particular record to get there. And like, like you just said, it's uh, with witch hunts, the external manifestation of fear, uh, not just an, an external manifestation, but the fact that people are looking to oppress others who are different. That's very blatant, very obvious. But like I say, as you said, he would have perceived maybe the internal is more difficult because how do you how do you describe what's going on in you that might be universal for all the other listeners whereas people looking to oppress is pretty straightforward absolutely absolutely yeah it's just uh just genius all around <clears throat> excuse me and then it goes to the next section um that we can discuss as well i'm not giving in to security under pressure i'm not missing out on the promise of adventure I'm not giving up on implausible dreams, experience to extremes, experience to extremes. So maybe we can 
each talk about this little section unless somebody has something in particular they like to address on this part. Yeah, I too heard impossible. <laughs> I still Fair. I still hear it. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was implausible until uh, I reread the lyrics for this. So, but I'll just go ahead and like carry it on. This was always the one that was, I was always the most, this part of the song was always the bit I was the most unsure about. I always like, every time I think about it, about what it means, I would kind of work my way out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of in a weird sense, because I get obviously the song's about fear. It's practically in the name. And like, you know, how it, how it, and basically its relationship to, to you as a person but the part that made me 100 percent realize it was a uh, as i'm not missing out on the promise of adventure because like you constantly hear about instances where people like they had that chance but they were too scared to go all the way right so what are you missing so that's in my in my opinion that's the standout line of this section of the song yeah and very very akin to how neil led his life as well you know he was always like what's the most awesome thing or excellent thing i can do today and he really lived by that and that's really something that uh is such a testament to um a life well lived the line that stuck out for me was uh, i'm not giving in to security under pressure you know i'm not playing it safe you know you know i can make the wrong choice or i can just play it safe but that, that's kind of stuck about me. That was like his defiance. I'm, I'm doing what I'm going to do. Wasn't this Fair about around. the time that he started doing uh, bike riding? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that, so. that would sort of make sense where, you know, his effort to not just sit and read books and to go and experience the world kind of coincided with these lyrics coming up. Yeah, I think even that theme carried over into like albums like Roll the Bones where you take that chance, you, you live you know, a certain way where you want to live the fullest version of yourself that you could do, you know, without the fear, you know, really trying to escape the fear because fear always is one of the worst enemies that you could, you know, I guess, uh, you know, have a relation with, <laughs> you know, so, but yeah, totally agree with that. And moving on to the next section, let's go back to there's a lot of great points in here, too. I want to kind of um, get into the next section and um, talk about the next verse. Suspicious-looking stranger flashes you a dangerous grin. Shadows across your window. Was it only trees in the wind? Every breath a static charge. A tongue that tastes like tin. Steely-eyed outside to hide the enemy within. So, Michael, would you like to address this part of the tune? Yeah, so... You mean you can take this in a multitude of different ways. Um, if you're looking at it uh, from a business vantage point, you know, especially the last few lines, you know, there's an old adage of you fake it till you make it, where on the outside you can seem very uh, sure of yourself, and you know, inside not knowing what it is you're doing, um, you know, and, and you know, very much people lead by, you know, thinking that you know what you're doing. And, and, you know, you look very calm and confident and, and, and very sure of yourself. And inside, you're a nervous wreck. Um, you know, the first four lines are very much things that on the surface may seem very plain and very innocent. You know, uh, a shadow across your window. You know, uh, it could be one of a trillion things. But in your head, you automatically go to possibly the darkest place. Why is that? Um, you know someone maybe you're walking across the street and they just grin could be that for a thousand different reasons but again your mind automatically goes somewhere dark you know why is that is that and in, something internal um you know it, it it goes back to the fear but your own fears for whatever other reason almost being used against you and obviously he'll he'll deal with that later in freeze but you know this is almost the, the the birth of that you know um um you know oh my god what do i do something is not right but there's no there's nothing there in reality i think yeah. just to play off that like 
I love um, the reason I love witch hunt so much is because of the imagery. Like I think I, I talked about that because I was on that uh, episode, a song discussion for it. I talked about there the imagery is like so vivid or like I could see it, like it was very cinematic, like a movie. This one, I see from this very room that I'm in, because this is the, this is my childhood bedroom. And like this window, well that window, you guys can't see it, there's a window behind me. There was a certain angle that if I caught my neighbor's tree, it sort of like looked like a hand. It doesn't, but when I was like five, it was the most terrifying thing ever. And, like, it's just that, you know, that, yeah, you know, the sort of, like, the internal feeling is is very important in the second half. But for me, the first half, just, like, you know, was that sound just a tree that's literally touching my window right now? Or is that someone tapping on my window? It's so, like, just, like, your mind racing. Is jumping to bo- conclusion. Yeah. Jumping to Is it the boogeyman underneath your bed, really? Yeah your brain jumping to conclusions yep. when like, you know, that's not the case. Like, you know, it's like, Oh, that was, you know, probably nothing. Probably just someone, you know, like someone smiling down the street, just like, Oh, you know, hi. Then your but, mind just starts racing. But do you know it? That's the thing. Exactly. That's- There's now some, some of the imagery that you're painting. Now you have me think of the movie poltergeist as far as the uh, branch on the uh, window and whatnot and the boogeyman under the bed. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's one of those weird sort of. And that movie that just movie too, out, right? Yeah. And that movie just came out a couple of years prior. Mm-hmm. That's true. So, right. That's right. Amazing. You know, put yourself back in 19, 1983 when he wrote it. Poltergeist came out in eighty two. That's not that far off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's, that's true. Right? It's funny. Right? Amazing what your mind does. You know, it could be your greatest asset or it could be a liability. You know. Well, there was a point in the. Uh... Uh, beyond the latest stage documentary where Neil made the comment about uh, some of the lyric writing in regards to uh, he made the the quote, he had the quote everyone is a reflection of me in that he was writing as he perceived all of us, uh, everyone and in in that respect this is, this this, uh, section the idea of someone flashing you a dangerous grin, the idea of people sort of putting it in, you know, as humans, we tend to put it in ourselves as in what's this have to do with me? Well, probably nothing, but the fear, probably everything. And it's got to be the worst case scenario. Indeed. Indeed. And that brings us to the next part of this. uh, The last part of the lyric to you, is it movement or is it action? Is it contact or just reaction? And you, Revolution or just resistance? Is it living or just existence? Yeah, you. It takes a little more persistence to get up and go the distance. So it's just amazing the flow of everything. And now it's that, now it's like you have to answer this question about everything we just talked about. Like, what is it? What brings me into these mind bits of the, where's this fear coming from? How did I, how did I possess this fear? Where is it, you know, what is it doing for me? Is it, is it, is it helping me in some way? Is it holding me back? Is it, what, what are the things? So now it's that, that final arrival on the internal. You have to really ask yourself some questions. Do you control it or does it control you? Uh-huh. And that, with the movement or is it action? Like, are you just doing the steps just to avoid the fear? Or are you actually trying to overcome it and just look beyond it? Right. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's- I mean, the question often gets asked, like, you know, you're surviving, but are you living? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and I think, I think this, this, this kind of question is the part of the song that I think, like, really, I think gets everyone thinking. Less in the terms about, like, oh, what you're hearing, like, you know, everything like that, but more of that, like, you know, you know am I doing this? You know, am I getting through day by day or am i fully embracing everything that i do it's almost it's a precursor to marathon in in a way yeah sure yeah amazing 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 
So in terms of the music, um, there were some things that were mentioned uh, even before today about the music um, that uh, I thought were really, uh, we can actually maybe touch on a few of the bits. Um, and in particular, if, you know, if Alex wants to jump on some of these things, and of course we can all, you can all talk about it right. as well. Um, cause of course that's important too. You know, I mean, as much, I'm, when I first heard this album, I was really into the music, like super heavy and the lyrics came a little bit later on. Um, so the fact that we just discussed all the lyrics, then we can maybe touch a little bit on some of the musical bits of this t- tune that stand out. So, um, so maybe Alex, if you want to lead some of that off and we can all piggyback off you so um yeah my my observation was that for the first you know you figure as ralph has in back of them the the record side one uh the three three out of four tracks are about 140 beats per minute so it's not fast but it's not slow moderate tempo moving along um the subdivision of the beat for after image more driving eights as far as um um Sorry, just an early warning. It's there, it's moving. But this one, uh, Lifeson plays more 16th note patterns and some uh, backbeat kind of chord strikes. Uh, the verse chord progression is pretty straightforward, B minor, G, and A. Um, not an uncommon chord progression. Um, but he begins with, as I would say, kind of a classic Lifeson sort of arpeggio, which... Um, is not not really you know not common you know it's sort of as you say it's it's the life's an intro with a with an arpeggio that has really um, is compelling I'm just I'll say I'll just leave it at that and then moves into something more of a straightforward verse before making some changes uh, once we get into choruses and the bridge section but uh, a good way to end side one as far as having an up tempo number that also has a fade out at the end which the popularity of fade outs uh, waned a uh, decade within a decade. But yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. More oh, people yeah. on this panel. That was, that was perfect. We, I think I, it was like, I don't think at least for me and I might be biased because I am a bass player, but there's no talking about the enemy with him without bringing up the incredible baseline that's going through this entire, uh, entire thing it's weirdly funky like you know, especially compared to like you know distant early warning or you know even red sector a you know you go from those songs and you know then all of a sudden you basically you get you know a police song like i remember um neil did an interview with um i don't know how to pronounce this guy's name uh George Strombopoulos, is that it? Yeah, perfect. Strombo. Strombo. Thank you. I I will hold that as a badge of honor. Uh, <laughs> but I remember he was doing, um, he was talking about like um, the creation of moving pictures. And it, you know, he was just like, yeah, you know, whenever we're making an album, you know, today we're not rushed. We're, you know, the fabulous man or rock and F. And this is like, if this, oh, totally. isn't, if this isn't fabulous, man, nothing is. Yes, you know. I mean, Alex like, was totally doing his Andy Summers impersonation yeah. here. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, and you know, I just, I really, I enjoy everything, everything about the music of this one. Uh, I know we're, you know, we're not at closing thoughts, but I'll just spoil my thought and just say <laughs> this is my favorite song on the record, and this is top five of all Rush for me. So, all right. it's got a so, very um, Zenyatta Mandata. Mm-hmm. Forgot a Blanc feel. Um, it's also other than in a very small bit in the chorus, there are no keys. Whereas di- uh, distant early warning, heavy keys. After image, all keys. Red sector, all keys. Other than the very little small hits uh, in the chorus or the post chorus, there are no keys. So it is space between drum. Mm-hmm. So there's something about that too. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of a mixed album in that regard a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. So something for everybody. You got the, the bass players who enjoy, you know, Getty's playing and the keyboard people. And it's just a funny sort of thing that happened in this period where people kind of went a different a different direction with their fandom. Like, oh, I don't care for the keyboard bits. But the keyboards are, you know, really a vital part. And I wasn't really a big fan of the keyboard thing initially, but then I kind of came around where it's like you're adding these keys in for effect, 
for you know for dramatics for atmosphere i mean so i kind of i slowly came around to you know really enjoying this period of even though i came up in this period with rush and you know saw power windows as my very first rush concert that tour but it took me a while to kind of come around to the keys but then i i found the vitalness of the keyboards and what alex did with that to get himself in there i mean that just says so much about him as a musician i mean amazing so yeah, I remember um, Getty didn't, I don't remember which, he's probably said this a bunch of times and I only like heard this once. So I'm not even going to try and pretend to know where I heard this from. But during this era, like Alex really would try to kind of find his spot in the song. And sometimes you kind of get a situation, um, like I bring up um, on a, a motion detector where like there is long periods of time where Alex is just not playing. I think it's a motion detector. Um, there's a song on Power Windows where he's like basically doing nothing for a long period of time. But this song, he is like pretty dominant in it. And even when the keys are being used, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's a really weird song. And I just adore everything about it. And also Neil's drumming. Amazing as always. I don't even think we need to mention that, but I will. <laughs> just so we, just so we can. There's not going to be the one person in the comments being like, "Why didn't you mention his drumming?" Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, the the outro, the uh, post uh, chorus outro, where he's hitting just about everything that moves. Mm -hmm. To me, that that's the highlight um, for him drum wise. Is after Getty sings "Experience to Extremes," where he's just hitting everything, just yeah. in different ways. It's just to me that that's drum wise the highlight of that song. Yeah, and it's more pocket too at the towards the yep. end as well. You know, more pocket, that. not as linear as, as the previous parts. Yep. Yeah, that's that's amazing, and even like the starting of the tune itself to revert. A little, <laughs> they all kind of gave almost like Alex got his little spot, you know on this tune in the beginning as well, you know, with just the sporadic hits. So it's, it just kind of reaffirms that relation that they had for each other musically, that they were all given their time and their moments very, very diplomatically. So, but they have to, it's three, only three guys, so. And, he, and even in the post, uh, the, the, break, the break at the end, you know, there's no, you know, Alex isn't soloing, they're just playing the groove. And you're just hearing the 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 synth uh, bass, you know, with a little, um, you know, they're just letting it ride out. They're just almost like they're jamming without even soloing or anything. Yep. And no one's really doing anything, but that's causing them to do everything. <laughs> so. Yeah, they utilize the space very well. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I guess. Um... Uh, of course, closing thoughts we can get to now. And also, um, there's no other version to check out live, so we can't really discuss the live um, aspect of the tune because it's one is one version. So if you haven't seen Grace Under Pressure live, please view that here on YouTube. You can find it. Or if you got the replay DVD set, watch that concert. It's excellent. Highly recommend. And I guess on that note, any closing thoughts that you guys like to end today with? I'm just thinking, unlike uh, Witch Hunt, which is, you know, a song about fear, and it's actually got a scary vibe to the song, this one is very upbeat, you know, when you're talking about fear, but it makes sense to go with the music that, you know, you've got the fear, like they said in, earlier, and but the choruses are defiant, like, I'm going to overcome my fear. You know, we have all got this default node network that we're dealing with, but we can still push past it. Yeah, it's like he has, he's telling you that there's a solution to the problem that you may have. So it's another one of these tunes by Rush where he, he offers up something universal, but also like, you know, this is a problem, but you can solve this problem. You can, like you mentioned, Ralph, you can overcome. We've all sort of touched on mm -hmm. that point in various directions. So it's a brilliant tune. I'm so, I'm so glad we got to talk Rob's about it. Rob's goes up to the video, hmm? actually, which takes part of the body electric. Yeah and 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 almost you know connects those two so i, I want i want to give a shout out to the video you know, yeah I'm as so cheesy excited. as it was it, well, it, it just kind of 
<laughs> shoehorn that in. I, I thought that, that was kind of like lead role, as in because there were so many so many videos filmed between yeah. Signals and Grace Under Pressure that you know that, I mean they had a, a video for Countdown, you know, and so the <laughs> idea that there was the video for this Body Electric, it's sort of I, I just felt like the production company probably said we need more. Okay. We'll throw this in there. And, I, and it's not a slam on them, but, you know, I mean, yeah, early 80s right. videos was what early 80s videos were. Yeah. Grammar oh, yeah, is think, grammar. Yeah. Well, I think, like, um, oh, go ahead, Ralph. No, I was just going to mention Kitty's face melting in the uh, oh, yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, like, I, um, I kind of mentioned on this earlier, is like, this being, like, one of my all-time favorites. And the reason for that is because of this is, like, quintessential rush because like when i at least for me like because when i think of rush i think of expert lyric handling and phenomenal music and like nothing like nothing beats well i mean several songs beat this because it's not my favorite but you know this is one of those those songs that like you know i could i don't think could ever work without the other I think that's such an integral part. Like, there are definitely some songs that Rush did where I feel like, okay, maybe this music could have maybe worked a little better with these lyrics. Or, eh, you know. I Like, you can almost mix around a little bit. Obviously, you can't, but, like, you can imagine it. But this is one that, like, phenomenal music, phenomenal lyrics, both working together to create something just amazing. Perfect, perfect way to, to wrap tonight. Excellent, excellent. Michael, thank you very much. Your first first round table. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, yes, yeah, so I guess on that note, uh, no pun intended, we can conclude. And if you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe this channel so you can see all the round tables, the deep dives, everything. So thank you so much. And we'll talk to you guys on the next video. Thank you. Take care.